Welcome to Tigray Television. I am Erin Yamano. We'll be reading the news for you today. Stay tuned. Proceeding to the details, President Dodot Zongogam Kale sent a letter congratulating recently re-elected President of the Federal Republic of Somalia, President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed. The President of Tigray stated his government's readiness to work with the incoming leadership in safeguarding the peace and stability of the Horn. Mohammed's prede predecessor, President Mohammed Farmajo administration's tenure will most notably be known for its relationship with the Eritrean dictator Isaiah Saforki that led to Somalia sending hundreds of troops for the war on Tigray. Abel Zagabu has more. President Debrut Ngaru Mikhail sent an open letter to recently re-elected President of the Federal Republic of Somalia on Monday, congratulating him on his re-election as President of the Federal Republic. The President emphasized his belief that the reinstatement of President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed was a clear indication of the aspiration of the Somalian people to be an anchor of the stability and peace in the Horn. The end of the last term of Hassan Sheikh Mohammed marked the start of half of a decade of instability in the Horn, whereby his incumbent Mohammed Farmajo played a leading part. His unusual close ties to Eritrean dictator Isaiah Saforki, who is known for his attempts to destabilize the region and weaken regional institutions that encourage accountability and cooperation amongst nations in the Horn, had led to the participation of hundreds of Somalian troops in the war on Tigray. The 66 years old President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed is known for his pro democratic and decentralization policy in the Horn Nation that includes the provision of legal recognition to regional states council in Federal Republic of Somalia. Five civil society organizations in Tigray, including Tigray University Scholars Association and Alliance of Civic Society Organizations of Tigray, issued a statement on Monday calling the designation of Western Tigray by human rights groups Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch in their latest report on atrocities in, in the area as awarding criminals. The statement also condemned the failure of these organizations to explicitly state and hold, and hold accountable the Eritrean state for its part in the atrocities in Western Tigray and asked that these faults be remedied. Our reporter Salomit Khalai has more. Tigray University Scholars Association, Alliance of Civic Society Organizations of Tigray, Magala University Human Rights Center, and Magala University Legal Aid Center issued a statement on Monday opposing the joint investigation by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch on atrocities in Western Tigray for its designation of Western Tigray as a contested area, saying the choice by the human rights organizations to designate the area as such would justify crimes and atrocities committed on civilians in the area. The statement also criticized the choice of the human rights organizations reporting of the Micadra massacre and said the organizations had been influenced by the narratives of the Ethiopian government that has so far disregarded and failed to acknowledge atrocities committed on Tigrayans. The joint statement also emphasized that it was wrong to refer to elected government of Tigray as the TPLF and requested that this will be remedied in future reports on atrocities in the region. The statement did, however, thank the human rights organizations for their role in exposing the scale of violence on Tigrayans in Western Tigray and said it was willing to cooperate with organizations in further documenting the violence on Tigrayans and bringing perpetrators to justice. The joint report by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch was issued in April and is one of the most extensive accounts of the violence committed on Tigrayans in Western Tigray. An eight months long occupation of Tigray by allied Ethiopian and Eritrean forces has seen the arbitrary and mass killings of thousands of civilians, looting of private and public properties, the detention of displacement of millions, torture and horrific widespread use of sexual violence as a weapon. Our reporters spoke with a young woman kidnapped by Eritrean forces, tortured for two days and later raped by a known Eritrean official. Our reporter Sarun Zagai has more. On November 30, 2020, a young woman, mother of three, traveled from her home in Gamhalo to Badimme to look for her missing son and nephew. They had lost touch with one another at the outbreak of conflict. In a place called Kokomdima, she found her son but continued her search for her nephew. On December 9, while she continued to search for her nephew, she would run into two Eritrean soldiers who held her captive for days. Two Eritrean soldiers found me. They locked me up in a room. I knew what they were going to do to me, so I started begging for their mercy. I told them that I'm a married woman with children. I also told them about my stitches that I had gotten while giving birth through an operation. 
One of them said, so what? And then they started drinking and mocking me. It was the most horrific night in my life. The young woman was locked up and tortured for two days and later raped by an Eritrean official. <laughs> بوست ببيت بكلاس وسط السرين مرهوي بالان يشاشابي تعم حداري مالتنا His name is Marhawi. He is an administrator of Sheshabit area, Gashbar Kazon in Eritrea. He locked me up, beat and tortured me for two days. I begged him to release me, but he told me no. I told him I'm ill and I even showed him my medication, but he didn't believe me and said I was keeping the medication for to grind fighters. And then he raped me. The survivor says that after she was raped, the soldiers tortured her for hours and called her derogatory terms targeting her to Gryan heritage. <laughs> I was detained in Sembel. Just because I told them I'm Tigrayan, they tortured me and called me names. For more than eight hours, I was hung upside down. They apparently called the type of torture the number eight. It was excruciating. I was crying and begging them, but they didn't listen. The man who was torturing me, they were calling him Udrashi. He would call me Dirty Agama. He told me that I deserved to suffer because those that were fighting them were my brothers. The survivor says that while the physical wounds may have subsided, the psychological trauma remains very much intact and has affected her as well as her family. The sexual violence that I was subjected to has left a dark spot on my marriage as well as on my children's mental health. I was not the only one traumatized by the violence. My husband and children are also traumatized. My children don't want to hear what happened to me. It has traumatized them. They don't want me to tell my story to the press or even at the hospital. But I do it because I know there are hundreds of thousands of women like me and I want them to come forward and get help they need, including medical care. The violence that has been inflicted on women and girls in Tigray has been all the more traumatic due to the lack of care for both their physical and mental wounds, care that has become almost impossible to access as the Ethiopian government continues to block aid and medical supplies. The destruction on major economic institutions in Tigray has been one of the devastating features of the ongoing conflict. During their eight months of occupation, invading forces would loot and destroy factories and businesses across the state. Our reporters visited Dima beekeeping plant near Adigrat, where employees say the factory was target of deliberate destruction by invading forces, who had destroyed more than a half a million dollars worth of property. Kabro Moldebrahan has more. Dima Beekeeping Development in Honey Processing Policy, found in Adigrat in the eastern part of Tigray, is just one of the many factories in the area deliberately destroyed by Allied forces. Alam Tagay, the general manager at the Honey Process Plant, says soldiers deliberately looted and destroyed equipment in the factory, destroying property worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. The factory is assumed to have lost over half a million dollars worth of equipment here, including the site at Azbi Umberta and the machines that process the honey. They have looted all that is useful and destroyed what was left, and then burned down the structure. Alam says the factory used to produce more close to 6,000 quintals of honey for the purpose of export and local consumption, emphasizing that the factory brought in a lot of foreign currency for the country. <laughs> The factory owns one of the most up-to-date technologies for processing honey in the Horn of Africa. We had both the processing and packaging machinery, as well as a mechanism to ensure quality. We had certain quality assurance machines that are not available anywhere in East Africa. We had an international market, especially in Europe, Asia, and the United Arab Emirates. They destroyed it because they knew how productive it is. Alam says this has not only set back companies like this, but have put smallholder farmers that produce the honey in crisis. Our products has lost much of its market because it's no longer available now. This was done purposely to weaken the local farmers and to destroy opportunities for youngsters in Tigray. Gabramadin Nugus is a security guard at the factory. He says he witnessed the destruction of the factory by invading forces. <laughs> Everything is ruined. I can only see ruins. The owners can't pay my wages now, but I have seven people that depend on me. We depended on the income I have received from this factory. I am in a difficult situation. The systematic destruction of factories across the state has led to the destruction of much of the wealth created over the past three decades in Tigray, leaving many desperate among us a catastrophic humanitarian situation that has left many in need. An ethnic cleansing campaign in Western Tigray has led to a massive number of internally displaced persons in Western Tigray.
all of whom depend on humanitarian assistance to fulfill basic needs. Our reporter, Win Takidana, has spoke to Aoud Tashbayana from Western Tigray, who is now sheltered in an IDP camp in Ma'ala and expresses her harrowing journey. November 10, 2020 was just a normal day for Aoud Tashbayana, a mother, a merchant, and resident of Maigaba and the district of Walkait in Western Tigray, before suddenly the Fano, a paramilitary group from Amhara, arrived to their village in a weary house of the morning and started to wreak havoc. <laughs> She says her and her family sheltered in a cave for days, afraid of Ethiopian forces that were committing atrocities, but couldn't find food. But Aotash says the siege didn't end there. After only sharply missing the Fano, she was forced to confront Eritrean forces that were indiscriminately shelling the surrounding area. <laughs> Awatash arrived in the IDP camps in Magala, but she says life hasn't shown any improvement. Lack of humanitarian assistance has meant that both her life and that of her children is hanging by a thread. <laughs> Aotash calls upon the international community to play its part to ensure that basics like food and medication is able to reach the millions in dire need in Tigray today. This IDP camp in Magala alone shelters more than 7,000 women and children, all with no access to food or medication. Art has been one of the most affected sectors since the start of the war on Tigray by Ethiopian forces, and artists that once had bright and promising future are finding it difficult to fulfill even the, the most basic needs. Our reporters had a brief stay with a young musician, Tsagai Haragut, and asked how his industry has been affected by the war and the devastating siege that has followed. Aragai Garumkeil has more. Tsagai Haragut is a young musician and a resident of Makale. He studied music at Macaulay University and got his first degree with a piano major in 2019. However, Tsagai couldn't able to fulfill his dreams at the moment, as the ongoing siege has already killed every job opportunity in Tigray. Currently, Tigray musicians are found in a very harsh situation. For example, I used to lead my life performing in a various stages and ceremonies. As you know it, our job is much related with the cultural and social life of our society. So we used to perform at wedding ceremonies, birthdays, holidays, concerts and nightclubs. However, such kinds of occasions have been terminated in Tigray due to the deadly war and the all-encompassing siege that followed it. So these days, life for musicians has become very difficult and we are found in a very devastating situation. According to Tsagai, his music life has been given him the chance to tour the whole Tigray state and even far to Sudan as he had the chance to work with different prominent artists. But currently, he hardly wins his daily needs as the ongoing siege has turned everyone's life in Tigray upside down. I had a band club, artist film, and I had a band in the club, and I had a band in the club. 
بتعمينا بزح سرحت نسرح نيرنا. I used to work with the Ahad band that is owned by artist Filman Bakala, and we used to work a lot of things together. We were touring the whole Tigray, working with a local NGOs that is working on creating societal awareness about communicable disease and reproductive health. I also had the chance to go to Gadari, Sudan, for an intercultural exchange concert with popular Tigran musicians, and I never imagined even for a second that my life would be turned into this mess. I had very big and bright dreams instead. The guy also said that he never read or heard such kind of life as the people of Tigray are living in at the moment. I don't think such kind of life under siege was experienced at any place in the world. And I don't even think such kind of life would be experienced in the future either. Personally, this is the worst part of my entire life. because I am denied of my basic needs, and this is also true for the rest of the people of Tigray. What is worst is, people are starved while they have money on their bank accounts as services like banking, telecommunication and electricity are cut off in Tigray by the Ethiopian government. On the top of that, it is even impossible to get help from others who live outside of Tigray, as there is no means of communication in the state. I think all these things are done on purpose, and I have no other words to describe the current situation that we are in. The story of Tsaga is just the story of 6.5 million Tigrayans who are suffering from a man-made starvation caused by the Ethiopian government by deliberately blocking much-needed humanitarian assistance and terminating basic services like banking, telecommunication, electricity, and transportation. Ongoing siege that has discontinued all essential services in Tigray has left millions in dire need of humanitarian assistance. But the situation is even harsher for those with special needs. Our reporters visited Maharit Gaurawahid, a displaced mother with special needs, to observe the devastating impact of the siege on her family. Win Takidana reports. Children, the old and the weak were not spared in the violence in western Tigray that has killed many and displaced more than a million. The most vulnerable were forced to leave their homes in search of shelter, food and medication. Maharit Gawrawahed is a visually impaired mother of two. She left her home in Korarit in western Tigray in November of 2020 and has been on the run ever since. <laughs> I left my home in Korarit in November. They told us the Fano were coming and how violent they were, so I just started running with those around me. They helped me escape and get back to my birthplace in my Gaba. I stayed there till March 2021, but things there too started to get bad, so I came here. The journey to Magala was anything but easy. Since I'm blind, it was hard for me to keep up with the others. It was also very difficult to manage my children with all the chaos. That was the most difficult time in my life. Mahari tells us that even after she arrived in Magala, her and her children, like the almost 2 million IDPs from different parts of Tigray, have not been able to access any humanitarian assistance. As soon as we arrived, they placed us in a school called Garabz Addo Elementary School. It was very difficult to get shelter there, even for those who don't have special needs. There was no water or food. It was worse for me because I got there alone, so I had no one to help me cook and feed my children. Before she left her home in Western Tigray, Maharit says she was a teacher for people with special needs in Korarit. Her and her husband had hired help to assist them with their needs in their home and care for their children's needs. <laughs> My life before, my disability didn't really hold me back. I was able to hire help to help with the children. I also had family close by, so I never had any problems caring for my children. Maharit says IDPs at camp in Magala do their best to support one another, but the siege has made it impossible to access even the most basic items. <laughs> This place is not attuned to the needs of people with disability. It doesn't even have food or water. People go to our Sema church to bring water, but I cannot do that, so people share what they bring with me. But no one has food. More so, there is no medication. It's so difficult when your children ask you for food, but you cannot give it to them. 
Mahari says the suffering of the grandmothers and children should be a burden on the back of all people around the world. Everyone should take responsibility to ensure that humanitarian assistance is able to reach Tigray. The world is just stating what's going on in Tigray, but that's not bringing about any change. It should take meaningful action. There are more than 2 million internally displaced persons in Tigray whose suffering has been exasperated by the almost a year-long siege on Tigray that has made it impossible to access food or medication in the region. Well, that wraps up our news for the hour. Next up, we have Tigray Television's original production on the environmental impact of the war on Tigray. Stay tuned. <laughs>